The Team Never Quit podcast is sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union, where members can enjoy a savings rate of nearly two times the industry average. You can learn all about this and more at NavyFederal.org. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Team Never Quit podcast. As always, thank you guys for listening and watching, and please don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button wherever you get your show. So today, before we kick it off with our special guest, let's go to our weekly Patreon question of the day. And today we have, what is your go-to favorite board game or card game? taboo i would probably say mine is cards against humanity that one's what a little that? too raunchy <laughs> but that one's more fun for people in my age yeah for We're having a good old-fashioned monopoly <sighs> yeah that one's a classic there's this new game called bananagrams have you heard it uh, yes is it like a board game or are we talking about on the phone it no no, no. It's, a, it's a it's it's like pieces kind of like um, like um, um scrabble scrabble pieces. Uh-huh. but you get to line it all up and just create your own words based upon what letters you get and we get some pretty knockdown, drag out yeah. bananagram wars going on in our house my, my little... wife's an editor and so she always kicks my butt is she really yeah <laughs> Yeah, she makes me look good. <laughs> That's right. I forgot that she is. Uh-huh. I think I said something to you, but I was like, what's that even like? Uh, well, going to a restaurant is sometimes a problem. Even like the menus, she, she'll look at it and say, ah, oh. she'll just like, ah. Oh. And I'm so like, she's a real one. She's yeah. a real, because yeah, the yeah. real ones do that no matter where they're at. They yeah. Help. And she keeps me, she keeps me honest because if I get a little bit too purple in my prose or my words, she's like, come on, bring it back. Or, or yeah. if I allow myself, my subject, my, my point of view, she's like, you're all about keeping yourself out of the story. Yeah, they're a great so she, she pulls me back in. So anyway, yeah, Bananagrams, it's just a word game. My little sister, Haley, loves that game. She's brought it to a couple of the family holidays and uh, we all love word challenges, so. Clue's good. Yeah. Clue is good. I like Taboo because it gets the family super hyped up. That's what they were playing on Four Christmases. When oh, that's right. Is that what that's called? Yeah, when they're buzzing Flip each the other. Tube. Yeah, 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 Flip yeah, right. the tube. Flip the tube for Christmases. Yep, yep. I feel like if for for just for the sake of marriage counseling, go buy those games. Uh. <laughs> Sit down at the dinner table and and pull one of those cards out and go, "Hun, what's your favorite movie?" Yeah. Yes. And then just learn what is really going because they have pretty much put all the que- the great questions in there because they're funny. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No one ever does that. They have to go, they go pay thousands of dollars for some person who's probably reading the cards themselves. Yeah. You just need a trivia game. It's a trivia, trivia game. Card game. That's all you got to do. Yeah. And then put some friends around to make, bring levity. Yeah. That way you won't get pissed. <laughs> we started awesome. doing that a long time ago. Yeah, we did ago. that. We, really? like, quarantine to... as well. We really got into, into Oh, yeah. That. We did too. And puzzles in quarantine. Oh, we love See, when he said that, I was like, man, we kind of, this is a puzzle family. Yeah. They'll throw those thousand pieces down every holiday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thanksgiving, there's a puzzle. Christmas, there's a puzzle. Yeah. We all sign it after we finish it. For sure. That and, and we'll do something. I mean, honestly, I'm probably the worst. I will sit there and stare at like a corner of the puzzle. Like, think I got to find this area. I don't know how to look. Oh, you don't move around? Thing. Yeah. No. And that's my problem. But what we'll do is sometimes she'll, we'll say like, okay, you got to go grab something at the store. Not until you find a piece. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. We, <laughs> we have a thing. Like everyone in our family has to do at least one piece. Even if they're not the puzzle people in our yep. family, the rule is you have to find one piece. One piece. Oh, okay, check it good. out. During quarantine, we had a puzzle thief. We had a thief. We had a piece thief. Uh, the last piece is always gone. It, and this is nothing but my family too. out there, and I was ready to do a homicide. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I had never gotten into puzzles before. Or dig through the vacuum cleaner bag. Mm. <laughs> Ours was yeah, we, we did a lot of cleaning during quarantine. So we kids. had a legit. We had a straight up thief. legit piece thief, man. Uh, uh-huh. That's the worst. It's the worst. At the end of that, it is so frustrating. I think I got good to him, too, because <laughs> we would, I mean, we would pitch fits. By yeah, the yeah. third. Wait, <laughs> Hunter's smirking like it was him. No, was it I'll, you? I, 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 I cannot. About our kids. I'm not over that yet. So if it is you, keep it to yourself. Oh, yeah. There's no statute of limitations. Someday you're gonna find this little Ziploc bag with full up, just all them. Just, yeah, just sitting there like. <laughs> oh <laughs> my gosh. I mean, I am a kid, bro. There must be 15 puzzles out there. All, all of them missing one piece. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. That's annoying. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah the great question. Great I feel like those are filler questions if you ever, like in moments we, we have. Mm-hmm. Like that's a go-to. Because there's a lot of great games out there. There are. There's so, so many. I mean, I, a bunch. Where I know we're missing some. Yeah. We're getting some. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, the Monopoly is all the one that we all know from childhood. Mm-hmm. Like, like that was our game, a, right? You have a sleepover, and it's like we're gonna stay up all night and play Monopoly. Play Monopoly. Mm-hmm. Come like two in the morning. You got toothpicks like holding your eyelids yeah. open. Everything's <laughs> hanging out from underneath the board. Everybody's got their cards up. It's that's right. I forgot. Uh, it's a good time. Rainy day. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. Right on, brother. Good question. All right. Thanks for being here. No, thank you very much. We uh. I'm excited to have you out here, man. I'm this, excited. <laughs> the, the, for a multitude of reasons. One about your your connection to our community and my fraternity and everything like that, especially uh, some of the guys, and then just the overall writer part. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, I'm really getting into that part of my, my life now. I was kind of thrown into it, but it's it's a, it's a joy to be around y'all to see how you do your business deal. Yeah. Because it's the best way to learn. It, it is, but you know, with me, I'm going to have a hard time explaining because sometimes I don't know myself. <laughs> <laughs> you feel like that sometimes like you'll write these stories and people will walk up to you and, or sometimes they'll come up to me and they'll notice something about the story that I didn't even put in there because mm. you can read some of the things we put down on paper and they'll, they can they can look into that and they can capture what what's happening and I was like oh, you know that's pretty good man I didn't know that was a thing I have a, a basic formula where I want to first of all especially in today's day and age I want to I want to hook a reader early because the younger generation and you know they are the attention span is so short short so i want to not only hook a reader with something interesting but i want to give them a reason to finish Mm. the book and that's i always try and get some sort of a cliffhanger something early early on um that will keep someone reading and then from there i try and just make sure that i just keep doling out spoon feeding those little reasons like ah maybe not give them everything like some people will say you I don't know what's going on right here. I'm all exactly. Mm -hmm. You don't do. You kind of want to find out, right? And I try and do that as well. But as far as like, uh, some people say, what's your what's your secret? What's your um, what's your uh, I guess your daily routine? Yeah. And I really, I I, I really don't have. I really don't have one. And I should. I've talked. I sat with John Grisham um, at the with at the Bush Family um, Literacy Foundation. Oh, Miss Barbers. And I, yeah, and I talked with him a bit about she it. First and, lady. Yeah, first lady. Thank you. And he he told me he had this system, and I said I can't get there. And he said, you know what your problem is? You write nonfiction. He said it takes way too long. <laughs> and you and he said that's why I write fiction. I can get a book out in a year. You write a book, and he said I bet you haven't written a book in less than a year ever. And actually. Fearless. We can talk about that later. I did, mm-hmm. but usually it's three plus years. And um, you say why that is? Uh, That's great insight. It makes sense now. I never really thought well, about it, but they do turn them out quick. It's because first especially of all, him. First of all, it's fiction. Like you know, like if if I something's wrong, they somebody can't come back to them and say, "Hey, that's wrong." He said, "Well, I made it up, and I don't make anything up." Because truth is stranger than fiction. I always heard that growing up, and now that when you get older, you realize, hey, he's like, hey, that, that's a factual story. Yeah. Those, those books that say this is this happened. Right. Those movies that say this is based on some true stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That'll always catch you. It does. Yeah. Well, because it gives, it's it's just more. You you have this sense that of a, of a wow, really like wow, that really did happen. In Hollywood, you're not always sure, but if it's an author with a book and their name on it. I want everything in my book. For if someone comes back and asks me where this sentence came from, where this quote came from, I want to have an answer. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I get, I get, you know, I'm fortunate enough to get asked to talk to maybe college students or uh, journalist students. And I always tell them there's one thing that I always tell tell them if they get to a point in a story where there's a gap, you need a transition, and you don't have it. What are you going to do? And some nonfiction writers will just kind of fill it in with something that makes sense and it's totally doable. But I always say. I would rather have a hole in my story than fill it with bullshit. Mm, And that's that's always been important for me. And um, sometimes maybe the story might have a little speed bump in there or something off. But I feel like if anybody ever asks me, I have an answer for them. Mm -hmm. Like, where did I get that information or whatever it is? And and that's where I've just tried to keep the integrity in the nonfiction. And it's hard because there's plenty of places where you could kind of make something seem completely plausible and keep a storyline growing. But in the back of my head, it would just haunt me. Well, you have a resp- a huge responsibility on your shoulders when you're writing nonfiction, especially about someone that's not here anymore. So there's a huge emotion with the family that's tied to it and yeah. their friends that are tied to it. So 
there's that weight a legacy. on your shoulder. Yeah. A legacy. Well, there's, yeah. a, there's, a, there's a split between those. Mm -hmm. When you're writing about Adam Brown, you're writing about him. Mm -hmm. Right. Now there's writing about a character that you come up with in your head that fits that description. Mm -hmm. Right. And th those are powerful, too. Yeah. I, don't even, I don't know what those are called, but that... Those are those are powerful stories too. Yeah, I know absolutely, and and there is something to be said for some stories that are very true cannot be told true because oh, yeah. certain people don't want oh, don't want shit told. Yeah. yeah, but you can still honor that story and that person by doing, it. and that's kind of what I, I keep saying every time I finish a book. After you know this one took five years that I wrote recently, um, I keep saying I'm going to try fiction next, and after I've given birth. And mm -hmm. I will do that. My wife will say, no, you didn't give birth to this book. Let me tell you about giving birth. <laughs> but what they what happens uh, uh, is... They can just, do that. Well, but, that just kind of like shuts everything down right when they pull that card. Oh, yeah. But that's what I do. And, I, and, and what she does agree with is she'll say, it's like giving birth. And then you know what you do? You forget. Mm -hmm. And then you do it again. That's yes. a superpower they have. <laughs> I had a guy power. try to describe that to me. He's like, hey, you know, when a guy gets kicked in the nuts, he never wants to do that again. It's <laughs> like women can experience the most pain that you can go through on the planet. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's what that is. Yep. And then three months later, like, hey, let's... Let's saddle back up. I'm like, the guy would never do that. No, you just said That's that. That's a freaking I just kind of superpower. I, know. I clinched up for a minute Superpower. <laughs> you can ask any guy years and years later, hey, bro, did you ever want to get kicked in, in the shorts? Again? No, never again. No. God, no. So take us back. How did you even get into writing? Oh, man. I Well, I will. In case people want to know, that, the, how, how do I become a writer? Yeah. How do you do I have a, a scribe inside of me? Or the, Right. I think that, you know, first of all, at some point in your life, you you are taken away by a, a story. Mm -hmm. And then if you can have, I had a teacher that once said, uh, if you, if a story will take you into your mind in just by the words, explained how these words are magic. I don't remember who it was. I wish I did. I'd be lying if I tried to. But one of my early on teachers said, you know, if, 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 a single, if these words put together, put pictures in your head, something like that. And the first book for me was, was Family Robinson. I just loved, you know, the idea of this, you know, a family being deserted by a crew in a tempest, you know, and having to get shipwrecked on an island and then surviving all these years and just all of, all the stuff they did. I grew up on 34 acres, um, oak trees and shrub brush and oh, chasing nice. blue belly lizards and my daisy BB gun over my shoulder. And I love building forts. And that was with Sammy Robinson, mm -hmm. you know? And so I will say that was what happened. And, and, and then what finally made me want to be a writer was honestly, I, um, I wanted to be a pro snowboarder in the 80s. And shortly before that, when I was 17, my mom passed away oh. um, after a four-year battle with cancer. Mm -hmm. And she, um, one of the last things she said to me was, if there's anything you want to do in life, do it now because you, you never know about tomorrow. And mm -hmm. she was, my parents were workaholics, always put things off like travel. Dad around? Huh? My dad passed away more recently. He's 80, um, when he was 83, about six That's years ago. That's a good ago. run. Yeah. You got a B in here. That's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, if I'm on a low B, it's pretty good. Totally, totally. My mom was 60. She had me pretty late. I, she was 44 when she had me, mm. which was pretty old at, back in, you know, 68 when I was born. But anyway, she said that, and um, just through this whole string of events, I wanted to be a pro snowboarder. I had an injury, realized that I wasn't going to be um sean white for those of you out there today or back in my time craig kelly and i went back to school and um to become a journalist because i had met a guy on a chairlift that was a travel writer when i was mm. ski bumming in breckenridge colorado and asking me all these questions and about the town because i was a local i had my season pass and he said um yeah i'm, I'm here for a week they put me up in a hotel i'm gonna write a story about it i'm all you get paid for this yeah <laughs> And I said, what a scam. How about that? What God did you, bless America. Yeah. What did you get? What did you major God. in? He said, journalism. So when I blew my knee out, I said, I'm going back to school and I'm going to write for a snowboarding magazine. I'm going to see the world on someone else's dime. If you learn how to write articulately, where, and you yeah. said it, and, and that's the difference between someone who writes for movies and the books. Like, well, they're the same. It's the writers, right? And they, yeah. in the movies, you watch the movie through their eyes mm -hmm. and they implant that in your head. So like, wow. But with that, before that, we had to come up with that. Yeah what that looked like to us. Yeah. That was always my fascination is the way I thought, I, or the way I saw it, and then when I got to see it from somebody else's perspective. I, and and the, when those two would come clash together, you're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't anticipate that. Right, and there's a certain, there's, there's a talent to that and an art to that, a very different, what do they, a lot of screenwriters call it the craft, right? right? Um, and it's true. 
that's that's how it goes so yeah that's that kind of answered your question to be a writer but then what shifted me to the writing about the military and the special ops communities and i um it was really 9 11. Mm -hmm. i you know i was writing uh, adventure stories you know i guess you know sebastian younger the perfect storm john krakauer into the wild um joe simpson touching the void amazing hey, all three of those amazing sebastian, yeah all them guys man um and I just was was. Um, That's one of my brother's favorite books in Void. Really? Yeah. Oh, it is. And they did they did a great adaptation with I mean, a, with they the did. documentary. Absolutely, they a sure really did. So what they what I my idea was after nine eleven is um, that was kind of the era not too long before that when Saving Private Ryan came out and um, Band of Brothers. They did, and there was hey. That's a that was a game changer. The Band of Brothers, Rainy Days like this, or the, all the Veterans Day Memorial Day. What they put that together so well. It's amazing. It's the best, and I like it. I like them both, but I like it better than the Pacific um, for the character development. You follow along, so I knew that was going on. I, I, you know what? I don't want to badmouth anybody, man. But I, you know, I don't know what's exactly what you're saying. Yeah, there's just something different. There is. There is. So um, I. I had heard that all of these World War II vets were dying, and a lot of them, their stories were dying with them. And 9-11 hit, and with that same thing in mind, I thought, you know what, this is our current Where greatest generation. And I thought, what's my part in all this? I never served in the military. Um, I always loved military history. I read my first you know, military book was probably Battle of Midway. Uh, my mom had gotten me that collection of Time Life books where once a month you'd get a thing on Vietnam. Uh, there was this black... Um, hardcover with photos i read all that and i just they still realized, do that the time life books i, I have those too the west gunfighters and the old west i'm not sure if they do but it was for me when that thing showed up in the mail i was yeah. just i was That's enthralled great. i'd read it so i just wanted to kind of do my part and tell the stories and do it without a, a spin no political slant i'm very like down the middle old school journalism let's tell the stories from the point of view of the, of the guys on the ground mm -hmm. and um that's when i found um the story of oda 574 for the only thing worth dying for um and i went and sat in on a a class at west point where i found out the captain of that team was teaching arabic and um just started meeting him and chatting with him and he agreed to tell the story if i went to the members on his team who didn't make it home their family members and said hey are you are you okay with that? Mm -hmm. And I made that that effort to go and meet uh, the families of Daniel H. Petitori and Jefferson Donald Davis, the first SF guys killed um, on December 5th, uh, 2001, right after 9-11, first SF guys. Mm -hmm. and, I guess, Dan. And, um, and Dan's father gave me a gift that helped lead me all the way through. And he said, uh, at the end of staying there for a weekend, two things, his mom said, Eric, when I was leaving, gave me a big hug and said, Eric, I was, terrified to see you and meet you but now i'm terrified to see you leave so Aww. she's a great lady <laughs> cheshire massachusetts little town in new england you know the tallest building of the church steeple yeah and um and then Town's built around that exactly yeah, yeah and his dad shook my hand one of those long almost too long handshakes shaking it and he said <laughs> you know eric he said i know you're going to do a good job and he said just do me a favor tell it like it happened mm. don't candy coat it you know, Dan was like a, a B minus C student. He wasn't an A plus student. He said mm. he believed in accountability. You tell it like it happened, and that's how you can honor Dan. And that right there took a weight off. Like I thought, you know what? I'm going to tell it all. I mean, this was a friendly fire incident with ODA 574. You know, mm. 2,000 pound JDAM got called in by their staff element that came in. Shit happened. There were mistakes. I remember when that happened. Wow. And um, that gave me kind of from a, the parent of one of the guys who were killed to tell me you tell it like it happened mm. and that was a gift because it allowed me to not shy away from the shit because the shit's real mm -hmm. yeah wow Kali. so after that what was your next book that you did um i actually it, it would have been um okay the only thing worth dying for uh Fearless. So Fearless was the next. What are you doing on the in-between? Because for non you said there's years in between each one of those. What do you do on that? Uh, well, I mean, the, the years in between really is, um, for me, when I write a proposal, it's like writing a book almost. So it takes me, uh, you know, anywhere from, you know, six months to a year to write the proposal to get the publisher behind you, mm -hmm. to give you an uh, advance to allow you to live while you're spending the rest of the time doing the book. If you were going to talk to somebody who was writing a book and, or, and they were telling a story how to get... How, how did how do they find you? Like how did you guys get into those houses? Because mm -hmm. it's as hard as Hogwarts. Yeah, it is. It freaking is, man. 
I uh, well, I got to tell you, I, I have to give all credit to my agent, Christy Fletcher. Um, she found me when I was writing magazine articles. I was the editor for. I did. I How did? Oh, she read one of your articles. She read an article. Oh, check. Roger, okay. She read an article and she said, "Hey, have you ever thought about re writing a book?" And she helped me to formulate uh, my very first proposal and. And that was how I got into that house. We're very small, and it, but, it, but the first one was the last season, which was not military mm -hmm. yeah. related. Um, and it was really, you know, it's it's like a it's honestly like a fairy tale story as far as uh, for a writer. It's really hard to find an agent, let alone get into a big house. And and she was just a go getter herself. Um, she was an assistant for a tell me your name again, around, Christy Fletcher. Mm -hmm. And she built, um, she took over a business from like an assistant a agent, worked her way up, bought, I think, the agency that she worked for, turned it into her own, and now here it is 23 years later that I've been with her, 23 years. And uh, she was recently uh, bought out basically by UTA. Um, oh, I know other, who they are. And they bought, they basically made her a deal she couldn't refuse. Yeah, they yeah. bought her actual agency and made her head of their literary division. And yeah, no, she. I sit in that house. Yeah, so you do, I know, yeah. Yeah, they represent Marcus for his speaking. Uh, well, there you go. Yeah. So yeah, you know it. And they, so they finally, they wanted to build up their literary division and they wanted somebody and I cannot think of a, uh, a better person because she, again, was that go-getter. Coleman Magazine's Finding Writers. She is so dedicated to the story. Um, and, yeah, I'm just really fortunate as far as that goes. I was and blessed too with mine. That's yeah. Awesome. He passed away, <laughs> but I had, I had the best. What, what was the his agent? name? Ed, Ed Victor. Ed Victor, I recognize the name. Yeah. Huh? Oh, my God. <laughs> the best. Had it tall, slender, wore the sweaters tied around his neck, wingtip <laughs> shoes, black and white. Oh my God. Played tennis, British accent. Oh. <laughs> Called me Marcus Darling. Oh my God. I had, I freaking. How could you not sign with that guy? That. Oh, in a heartbeat. He goes, you're the seal in battle. Just leave the rest to me. I'm the seal out here. And that's what he said to me. And I was like, oh. And I mean, the best. And my lawyer too, Alan Schwartz. I have the Schwartz. Mm -hmm. So. That's a superpower in itself. I, I got blessed. Yeah. I mean, freaking blessed when I got in there. My people who watch out for me. But they're was, all yeah. either gone or retired. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, reti yeah. Yeah. That's scary. It That's, is. Yeah. You know, but, well, look, I will say that Christy handed me off to Eric Lupter, who is um, kind of a co agent as well, because she, she got too busy and she knew when it got to that point. And so they both co agent me now. Like her name's still on my proposals mm -hmm. with Eric, and he's a powerhouse as well. And she introduced me to my attorney, who her name is Linda Lichter, and she's in. Um, in Hollywood and she is a bulldog as well. That's where they go. When they know, when they know, yeah. when people know that I'm re represented by her, they're kind of like, oh. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's why because I love know. saying that. They're, they're not gonna, they're yeah. not gonna. Where's your lawyer sit in the city of angels? Yeah. <laughs> That's where they go. I, I know this is a, uh, you have me here as a guest, but I don't, I don't really know the full story of how, you know, Lone Survivor came together. Like uh, as far as the writing and how did that initial, like, I'm gonna write this. The military, they did all that. They did all the that. Navy set the Navy said it. The Navy. I didn't. I ran from it. I was like, yeah, I was still in the hospital. And they're like, no, this is what we got to do. This is what's going to happen. That's why I got assigned my agent. I got assigned my lord. The best, the best of the best, showed up in that room when I was standing in there. All I had to do was just put out, maintain my military bearing. We got to choose them too. They gave you options. Right? I had everybody. I mean, so well, they except for those. So they basically those. Said, saw. They knew. They saw the the magic and of this story and honor you. They did. They absolutely saw something that I didn't, and that's what all those meetings were. But I, then the military. I've been watched on high ground since the very beginning, mm. and protected. The book was going to come out whether Marcus was involved or not, and so the military wanted they Marcus brought me involved. In. And Same with the movie. Yeah, I've heard that more than once with other with, with yeah. um, well uh, with Chris with American Chris. Sniper yeah. as well. He said the same thing. Like I, it was going to happen, and either mm -hmm. I can be involved and make try and make sure it's done right, mm -hmm. or I can step back and then I lose any say in it. And mm -hmm. that's fascinating. I did not know that. And How did I, I, not I was know assigned that? to live with them. Mm -hmm. That mm. was the greatest. Like, when it was time to do the movie, I got to live with Peter Burke. Mm. And then when it was time for to to do all the writing, I was with Patrick. I'd go I'd go up and see him. And just sit down, just get to meet that world. That's yeah. how I really got um, integrated into the writer's world is through Patrick. Mm. He's He was the best. I still mm. love that man so much. I mean, I had the best time hanging out with that guy. That's amazing. It was. When they when we, 
and I, I got to meet with all the directors and the agent, I, the producers. I didn't know how anything worked in any world. Right. But when they put me in there, they put me with the best. So I just got to sit back and, and learn and watch. That was the gift. Let's dive into something that's truly transformative for businesses, a tool that's actually been our secret weapon here at the TNQ Online Shop for years. It's called Shopify. Shopify isn't just another platform, it's actually the backbone of millions of businesses worldwide. And whether you're launching your first online store, expanding to a physical location, or you're celebrating one million orders, Shopify supports you at every stage. From selling t-shirts, to catering to outdoor enthusiasts, Shopify's versatile platform and POS system, it makes selling an absolute breeze. What sets Shopify apart? Their checkout is actually the internet's best, even boosting sales by 36% compared to other platforms. And let's not forget about my personal favorite feature, Shopify Magic. It's an AI-powered assistant that streamlines the selling process and has even saved me so much time and value. Are you ready to take charge of your business? Sign up for a $1 per month trial at shopify.com slash TNQ. Because when it comes to growth, Shopify is the answer. And you know what? You sit back and you do watch. Some people go and they just see the periphery. And I can just, I know from what we've talked even before we started chatting here at the table, you know, you've got that inside eye of, you've had a natural eye for story and story element. And so if, if the people's it, what I see, the people. like you get, you see the story, I see yeah. the people. Yeah. And I, I, I never, I guess that's a gift from God. Like, was when they put me in there, I, I am mesmerized by your gift. Mm. And so, and I just sit there, I can look past all that stuff because I can handle myself. Right. That, that, was the easy, that was the best thing to happen to me. <laughs> and so that, that stuff doesn't scare me. And when I'm sitting in there, it's all a matter of seeing who does what the best. And you can pick out your alphas. And, your, and, and, and I got to do that in most all the worlds we have here in the United States. And it was, it's a blessing. Yeah. And you probably have, I, I'm just guessing that you probably have a little bit of a, of a, um, a talent for smelling bullshit. Absolutely. I can see right through it. That, that, and I'll mess with them. He knows it immediately. Because, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a team guy. Yeah. I mean, you, know, you know now, and we're, we're professionals. Yeah. It's sniffing that out. Yeah. That's pretty good. So, and and, and the, the, the team guys I found that. It had to really, rub off on you. Yeah. Well, for when sure. You're around us doing this kind of stuff. We rub off quick. Oh, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I mean, and being vetted, you know, to tell Adam's story, meeting the guys and what we had, you know, for them to trust me, the family trusted me immediately, but they also wanted to see what the team guys thought. Oh, because we loved Adam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like it was different. When you say that, when you talk about him, we can talk about him right now. So, yeah, yeah. How did you even find out about Adam and get the chance to tell his story? I always uh, uh, pay homage to a man named Rick Stewart when people ask me this question okay. because he was a guy that was doing the Patriot profiles for the NRA. Oh, yeah, we know Rick. Okay. Yes. So Rick Stewart uh -huh. had done a story on uh, Gilbert Magallanes or Mag, and he was uh, he was the guy that used, I think, horseback therapy of the TBI mm -hmm. injury. He was one of the guys on me. blown up. Yeah. in that 2,000-pound um, JDAM bomb situation. Mm. And so you know, he did appreciate a... appreciate that. When you say that word, uh -huh. what, what that means, what that happens, no one has any idea uh, of how... what that is. I mean, that's the best way I can say that. 2,000-pound JDAM getting dropped on you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, and, and, and basically dropped on you i mean i think that the safety range for that is like a mile whatever they say and this... 500 pounders <laughs> thousands and then those the big boys yeah and that thing was called in it's it's i won't go into the, the you can i'm not trying to sell sell a book there's too much to do right here but if you look into it and you see that the whole um chain of events that led to that friendly fire incident it's um as a writer it was like watching a train wreck you know that you can't take your eye off yeah. and seeing it come together but anyway so he rick stewart was doing this documentary on um gill on mag and he was uh, got to the point where he was riding horses as part of his therapy and it was just really a magical magical piece and rick stewart has this voice it's like kind of this buttery radio voice it's mm -hmm. just smooth it's and it's yeah and Real he good. and he narrates it and so he met him and then he 
through that whole process, Mag said, you know, there's a book about my team and my mission. It's called The Only Thing Worth Dying For. And um, he said, you should talk to this guy. He did, he did my team right. It's, you know, this story is the truth. And he said, he's not military. And he's, you know, he's so he's, but what he does is he makes the stories accessible to people who aren't military. Mm -hmm. But the coolest thing that I think Mag said was, I read that book and I felt like Eric was with us. Mm. And that was the greatest compliment I could ever get. I, I actually get, um, yeah, it's just, it was, it was awesome. So Rick came and talked to me because he had met Adam Brown. Mm. And uh, before he obviously mm -hmm. was killed in combat in the Hindu Kush. Um, and he, had, uh, he knew the family and the team wanted Adam's story told. And he, and he just um, read the only thing we're dying for. We, we became friends and he introduced me to the Brown family. Um, with a blind date, via a blind date, literally. And there's a whole crazy thing with the number 24 and that whole process where he... You want me to go deep into yeah, this one? Yeah, a little let's bit? hear it. Yeah. Um, so he introduced us at a restaurant um, at, before the NRA National Convention, before he did a documentary on Adam. What year is this? Uh, this would have been... Uh, uh, the year after Adam was born, um, March 17th, 2010, Adam passed away, St. Patrick's Day. Okay. His, parent, his kids call it St. Daddy's Day oh. um, oh. to this day. And um, it was uh, just like a little less than a year after okay. Adam had been killed. So it was fresh. Mm -hmm. And he brought them to, he did a Patriot profile on Adam, and it was debuted at the NRA National Convention, which was in... With Phil Philadelphia, were they ever there? Philadelphia, Philadelphia. Chicago. Yeah, I, it was a big they're city. I'm, together now. Uh, that's where my I'm not sure. Damn. But he brought us out and he showed me this little documentary on Adam, and I was just so. It starts out with with Savannah, his daughter. Like at, at that stage, she was like I think maybe like five years old or so, mm -hmm. maybe four years old, and gets on screen and talks about her daddy. Mm. And then they go through the whole process. And at the end of this, it's like 20 minute documentary, I think, a little mini documentary. I just looked at him and I said, man, I said, if I wrote this story, I'd call it fearless. Mm. Um, and for just from listening to the people that talked about it. And he said, well, I hope that you will. Um, I'm gonna have you meet his parents tonight. Oh my gosh. And so he did this blind date and he met, had us meet at this restaurant. And I went and it was a place where you have to have a coat. And so I had, so I borrowed one, I think. <laughs> and then I, and I went and they checked my coat and they handed me my coat check and it was number 24. Mm. And when they handed me that, like I'm written, saw, I'd met uh, Larry Brown and Janice Brown, Adam's parents and Kelly Brown, his widow. And they uh, both like whispered a little something. I didn't know what it was about. Then we had dinner and we chatted through this whole conversation. Went back to the hotel where we were all staying, checking into our rooms. It was like we both had arrived that day. And um, Kelly gets her room, turns around and shows her parents. They put me on the 24th floor in room 24. Mm. And ended up that Adam's favorite number was 24. It was his high school football jersey number. Oh. It was Adam and Kelly's code number. Like when he came in late at night, he'd yell out 24 and she'd say 24. Oh. You know, they have the pin numbers, whatever. You know, 24 yeah. was it. And um, just from that, before they had met with me, they had said they prayed and they said they wanted to know if this Eric Blem was a guy that should write his story. And they asked for guidance. Mm -hmm. um, from Adam, from God, yeah. whatever. And they got that. And they said, right after that, they said, Eric, said, you're writing the book. I'm all, I brought like three copies of my book. You want to read my other books? I said, no, it's done. We're good. <laughs> you're the one. And we trust Rick. And so the craziest thing on top of that is the next day I met Ted Nugent at the convention. I'm walking dead. Around. <laughs> How about and that guy? Crazy, rock funny and roll. Guy. Yeah, rock oh, roll. man. And so the first thing I did, I... I I went into this booth where he was. Um, he wanted Big to meet Kelly, him, and Kelly and everybody said, "Well, this is Eric Blem. He's going to write Adam's story because they had all seen the documentary that had debuted." And he said, "Oh, oh that's that's awesome." And I'm as she's doing this. I'm chatting with his one of his bandmates. I said, "Is it true that he only he will only shoot something that he eats?" And he said, "It is absolutely true." He said, "Sometimes I wish he'd shoot a salad." <laughs> <laughs> he's a hunting uh, uh, captain backstrap porting yeah. for duty man he yeah. is all about it he was uh, hilarious so he says goes to me and he says here's my card he said um this is my my home when that book is done will you send me a copy i put the card in my pocket i fly home the next day 
I'm on the airport. I'm going through my notes and stuff. I'm, I'd written my agent and told her I love this story. I had just sold another book mm -hmm. that I'd worked seven months on a proposal. I said, I want, is there any way I can get out of this? Because I want to do this book about Adam Brown. And she said, Eric, you got a good advance. It's, you know, it'll take a lot of time. Plus, there's, you know, who wants to do a book about a Navy SEAL? What's been going on with Navy SEAL? There's a lot of them out there and out right now. I don't remember what the exact situation. Either there was a flood of them mm -hmm. or it needed to be some special. But she said, we'd need something really special that would want you to do a story about a Navy SEAL to happen. Mm -hmm. So I fly home to San Diego. Halfway home, I take that card out and I look at Ted Nugent's address and his address is 2424, I shit you not. Oh my God. Where he lives in um, in Texas, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, and I know that, and then I won't say the, the address, yeah. but the rest of it, but it's 2424. And I'm like, oh my God, how can that not make a believer out of you, first of all? Yeah. Second, um, I get off the airplane, everybody's around the, the TVs at San Diego International Airport at Lindbergh Field, and they're looking at it and I'm like, what happened? What's going on? He said, they got Osama bin Laden. Oh my gosh. And I checked my messages and Kelly had written me and she said, I just wanted to let you know, you know, we didn't tell you this, but that was Adam's team. He was SEAL Team 6. Because uh, Obama had yeah. said it was SEAL Team 6 at that point. Yeah. All that came together. And I wrote a letter um, and I sold that book based on a long letter. Wow. Yeah. Uh, oh basically explaining who Adam was addict turned his life around redemption story and at the end of the day he had written if i'm killed in combat um let people know who i really was who i was before yeah. i became a seal when i was a, you know a crack addict living in the gutter yeah stealing for my own family he wanted to do that and that's that's one of the reasons i wanted to call it i called it fearless because i thought that was the most fearless thing he did yeah to be able to, to die a hero and with all those skeletons buried Everybody would just remember that. Oh. And he wanted to open it hey, up. Hey, every team guy is different. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, he wanted to come from all across the board. Uh, children of children of adversity. People often ask what um, what makes, what's either a common thread in all these special ops heroes or just operators, whatever. And it seems to me one thing is everybody has overcome something already. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. can't remember who it was, but someone once said children of adversity. They were God's bastards. <laughs> right? Amen. I mean, they just separated us at birth. We all got thrown <laughs> into these freaking places and then we found our way back to the pond. Right, right. And uh, I mean, everyone was different. Yeah. Can we talk well, about- so, Yeah, so that's how, that's how I got the, the story about it, uh, to be able to tell a story. And not to go too much into his story, but for those that haven't read Fearless and we want you to read Fearless, um, in the movie, there's going to be a movie coming out about it, right? It is this close to, to greenlit. I mean, I've read, I finally read a script that I loved just last week. Okay. Um, but talking about who he was before, he wasn't he wasn't born into a, like a bad home, right? He was he was actually like all American kind of kid that just took a turn for the worse in high school. Is yeah, that right? it, 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 just after high school. Just after high school. No, yeah, yeah. he was a class. He was a kid all the parents wanted their kids to play with. You know, there's kids that you're like, yeah. oh, I don't like that kid that's you're hanging out with tonight in high school. Um, he would, I just looked at Hunter and he, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean anything by that. Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, and he, um, anyways, he was, he was a good kid. He knew what it meant to be nice at an age when most of us are little pricks. Yeah, he would dance. He would ask. He would had the the wherewithal to ask the wallflowers to dance because he knew that maybe they needed that dance. Aww. And so, after high school, his a lot of his buddies. His dream in life was to be a you know to play Friday Night Lights football was his thing. Mm -hmm. And then he didn't get to play like starting on a college team and went to college. And that whole like his wolf pack, his buddies were gone. Mm. Um, they all went off to different schools. And um, on a on a night that you know he made that mistake, and he tried crack cocaine one night with a with a girl, and um, that was. They had women, man. Don't get us into anything. <laughs> but wasn't he? <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know what? You see me stone face. Hey. I'm not saying a word. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say anything bad. I said they get us into anything. It will. You know what? A woman will change a man's religion and his politics. That's right. <laughs> yeah, countries have fallen over. There's one of them. I um, I read the book when it first came out, and so I'm a little foggy brained on it. But wasn't he with his wife 
in high school? Did, weren't they dating or friends at least? No. Um, so no, the, Kelly, you mean? Yes. Uh -huh. He he met Kelly after he um, went through rehab for the first oh, okay. time. He got okay. he got in trouble, okay. like twelve felony counts. He had stolen like even a handgun at one point. His parents were basically waiting for the call at night that he was dead. Mm. And um, finally, they took it to the point where he was in jail, and they didn't bail him out. And wow. they did that tough love approach, and in, and through that he. Um, found the Lord, picked up a Bible, which a lot of people do in jail, mm -hmm. and um, had a second chance. And even though, and then he met Kelly shortly after he was, um, via a court order, um, spent many months at a rehab center that was a faith-based um, rehab um, program. And after that, he came back and she stayed with him. And he had his relapses. And she would kept saying, you know, I keep praying and God isn't telling me to leave. And she stayed with him. And she she really is the, there's two heroes in Fearless, mm -hmm. Kelly Brown and Adam Brown, both mm -hmm. there, you know, and a lot of people look towards that. And we've all experienced it. Every, everybody everybody listening, I'm sure, knows somebody that had, has had a problem with addiction. Mm -hmm. and, um, and what makes it even harder is when it's somebody who had started out not in a bad place like, he was that all-American kid that everybody loved and just took made that wrong mistake. Yeah. It's a cautionary story. Yeah. It's a scary story. But man, it's got it's got to come back and it's got redemption. Yeah. And that's what um you know, it really is. I think when people say um can you wrap up this book in a short line like the elevator pitch and I just say it's the prodigal son meets seal team 6. Mm. That's a good one. Yeah. Team saved all, a lot of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, cuz they we wouldn't put up with that. Yeah. We're not allowed to do that stuff in there. And it's all, a, we're all the same age. It's just being in a fraternity. Yeah. And we, we're so accountable of ourselves. They've up to our manners. Think about that. You got the most alpha wild, just gutter cat wild yeah. in there. But they'll follow rules. If a sucker gets up every day and gets dressed, he can follow some rules. Yeah. And then when you put him around a bunch of guys like us and we feed off of each other, that's that, that was the best place for us. I think that's why I got a lot of guys have problems when we get out. Right. Babe, what was, what do you, what's one way for you to describe Adam? Cause you knew him in both. Yeah, you knew him. I mean, I, yeah. I could only put so much in the book. Do you have anything extra? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we got guys in the, in the, that we're going through buzz with that look like Navy SEALs. I didn't look like this in the beginning. None of us had ink. None of us were big and bulky. You know, like we all look kind of the same lanky and stuff like that. And he always had this freaking quirky smile on his face. And I mean, we got our asses kicked, man. I mean, we got our asses kicked. And there were days I'd just be sitting over there, and I broke my leg. And I'll never forget it, because I was right when they pulled me away from the class, I was still sitting with him. I kind of followed him around like a wounded. So you got pulled medically. I got pulled medically. Yeah. Double, double, double roll. I broke my femur. And kept going. She, that didn't yeah, I made it to second phase, and then on the run, I had fallen back. <clears throat> then they finally, they finally pulled me. But... He came and put his arm around me. It's going to be all right. Because, oh, oh, because they graduated during Christmas. I remember this being a big deal for all of us because we got our asses kicked so bad. The first break, we were all just looking for Christmas. Mm. And I knew that I, did, I had to go past Christmas now. And he's like, it's going to be okay. And then when they, <clears throat> God dang, when they graduated, I'll never forget the look on his face. You know, we get our trident and all that stuff. That's a big deal. But graduating buds back in the day, that was something. Mm. Like you knew you accomplished something. Because back then you didn't get your trident. You didn't get your trident. No, it was never separate. That was, that was all After different. After an ocean swim, yeah, all a that. while back, back, later. Yeah, yeah, man. It was all different. But you had to have your designation right first. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's completely changed. It's streamlined for the better. Yeah, now they you get it like when you graduate. Buds? You get the Buds. trident? Uh huh. Well, yeah. It was, it's, the old school probably had the problem with that, I yes. would think. They did. But the wars changed that. Mm -hmm. Wars changed who's old school yeah. kind of deal because the standards are set because we earned our stripes. Yeah. And uh, I only saw him pissed off one time. And I didn't know what to think about it. <laughs> you ever seen somebody who's really kind of like, hey, you know, cool. And, and and I grew up the way I did too. And I was still kind of, I didn't know how, I, I had the fear of each one of the guys because like, you don't know what they're capable of. You know, right. they can't, we can't keep that from each other. We yeah. don't know those backs. They don't really come out. Yeah. And because of that situation they're in, it's all new hell. So we're just kind of in it there together. Right. It's like, I don't care if you came from addiction or from a, a, a hard father or something like that. They're not there. Right. There's something new that was there waiting on us. And um, he was just always so damn jovial. And I, I told you this story earlier when we were doing the demo pit run. Had our boats on our head. It was dark. And he was the number one guy up, uh, up, which means he was in the front of our boat. And we had this huge boat on our head running. 
And then I hear this big gong sound. We're out in the middle of the, the beach in the sand. And it sounded like the church bell, like, come, no many party, that kind of thing. And there was, it was a, a sign that had been posted, like a warning, a no trespassing sign. This is thing, and we didn't see it. Yeah. And he hit that with his face, and the whole boat shifted. We dropped it <laughs> off our head. And by this time, everyone's so weak, and you know, people think their neck's about to break, and he's bleeding everywhere. And he had this huge racing stripe. I'll never forget it. I mean, uh, it was a part in the middle of his hair where the hair had worn off, and you could see it too. I mean, you could tell when someone was put. He got all ran over by a mountain oh, bike. Oh man, dude. <laughs> dude! If it could happen to him, it happened to Adam. Oh. It was a fun, and he always had the best attitude about it. If something he couldn't control got a hold of him, it didn't get him. I noticed that. Mm. Now, if there was something he could control got a hold of him, he would step. He'd step up. I mean, like you could see, kind of, he had something he could hold. He could hold that back. Mm. Like a lot of guys, seals especially, they they lead with that. They want you to see that in the beginning. Yeah. Those guys like Adam and Walter, and, and there's a few of them, man, they just don't know what to think about them. Yeah. They look like bankers. <laughs> or like a, he was a dart champion or some crap like that. You know what I'm talking about? You're yeah. Not a freaking Navy SEAL. Yeah. You're, you're, and the other ones are uh, oftentimes I would think kind of like a, a mad dog showing his teeth. Like they want you, they want you to see a little bit of what they yeah. got in them. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Mm. Yeah, if you want to growl, like I said, I was only pissed off once. Were you? Do you remember, because um, that story is so f- funny like i can't even imagine i think you said like the first thing he does is you don't have time to think about passing out or bleeding you just want to make sure did anybody see us freaking do that right yeah oh the funniest thing is when you see uh large men in pandemonium <laughs> <laughs> like when you're telling some of us to run some of us to drop some of us to hit the surf at the same time and everyone's running over the top of each other and when it's total confusion you can't speak and you're trying to get everyone to do the same thing that's comedy yeah that is comedy. That Pure is comedy, and you know, the, but you don't get that when you're in it, right? Because you're you're the butt of the joke. Nope. Yeah. But he had a way to see through that, and we had some other guys in our boat crew that were serious men. I mean, we were like serious men yeah. already. Right. We had this one joker that was a Marine Force recon, a Green Beret, and then he went to buds. This guy was in Adam and I's boat crew, <laughs> and the instructors asked him why he was there, and he said he was there to take a break. <laughs> That, that's what I'm talking about. That, that's what kind of dudes we're going through with. God, that I must, was just like, what the hell did I get myself into? <laughs> that must have just pissed off the instructors. Oh, they did. They, well, yeah, you know how we are now. I mean, they, we feed off of that. And it's our own kind, too. Like, seals will eat their own young trying to become seals. And just boom, boom. It just kept going and going and going. It's such a crazy dichotomy because you have I don't to, know how it works. I have no idea, but it does. Yeah. Well, because it's also, you know, eat your young. But then they're also, at the same time, trying to... Um, like and um, encourage this right. teamwork. It's the most because incre- so, they're molding it. So imagine something trying to kill you to mold it into into one of us. Yeah, it's like temper and steel. Our instructor said that, and we get rich, really hot, really cold, and beat the mess out of you. And when you're going through that, man, you're just like, I think they're trying to kill us. I'm like, yeah, we are. Yeah, I'm trying to kill you, but don't worry if you make it through there. Another thing I noticed, um, you know, with the teams uh, that I and then the, go to the next level, Dev grew is that there's a certain just a personality that mm-hmm. the seals have, where it's not just this like, you know, some people they hone in on the idea that they're the guys in the bar, you know, the bar fight, whatever. But they are people, people too. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to be a people person at some level to excel and and work your way up because it's very much a mental game. I think is what I've what I've figured out. Did you feel like that with Adam as well that yeah. he was? I was reflecting on 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 it because our biggest saying is slow is smooth, smooth is fast. But everything we do in that training is fast paced. No, if you if you get caught moving slow, your ass is done. Right. Well, there are guys who naturally move slow. That there are thinkers like they they want to see the problem, they want to think about it. But then at that point, like you ain't thinking. I want to see what your body does. Yeah. So when you throw a mind and a body and a spirit all into chaos and see them react differently. Well, then you're trying to teach themselves how to how to react. Right. And when you say we become our own, we do. Mm. And I, I didn't really notice that till I got out. Mm. And then the guys were coming out, and this was years and years later. I hear them talking, and I can hear the language. Mm. And then, but I speak civilian now. <laughs> <laughs> you understand where I'm going with that? Okay. Yeah. But when you when you pick it up, I can hear it in, a, in their tone. Like yeah. other military and there's any other, you can tell the guys who immediately. Mm. I get, one of my best friends just came out, and I can hear it every time he opens his mouth. Yeah. And it just takes time to detox. But yeah, we have our own. There's a there's a rhythm we get into up there, especially at, at Dev Group at six. It's man. Well, I'm excited for the movie to come out. The yeah, story yeah. needs mm. to be. You're gonna be told up there on the. Oh big, yeah. Okay, good for on sure. On the big screen, and it's already been told by you in the book, and um, 
for anybody listening, you have to buy Fearless and watch or read it before you watch it. It's a real it's, story too. Yeah. That, that's the best part because the movies have gotten away from that. And that's why the movies are terrible. Right. It's like there needs to be an eighties, nineties kind of re, where you talk about humans. Yeah. And what they're capable of, and then what they go through. That's what inspires. There's so, also oh, I was, there's, well, yeah, go, go ahead, please. No, you go ahead. Okay, I just was gonna say the one good thing that um, with social media, there's a lot of evil, a lot I hate about social media and or just the internet and the that entire world. But the one thing that it does do for true stories in Hollywood is that accountability factor because now they want you know the family to yeah. at least. Um, look at it and stand behind it and yeah. say that it's real. So there's always this, you know, if it's a choice between making something wacky Hollywood versus this is what really happened. Well, with Adam, it's easy because it's wacky anyway. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's a, it's one good thing. There's that accountability, I think, that people, word gets around if this movie is authentic. Yeah. And that helps, I think. That's one place where everybody can get the word out if it's authentic or not. And it's authentic and the people involved, I trust, are going to make it authentic. That's awesome. I can't yeah. wait to see that. So the next book that you did is about Roy Benavides. Yeah, close to home for you yeah. guys here. Do you mind? I don't, I don't want to take too my much of your time, but I want you to tell a little bit about that story and how you got involved with that. Oh, yeah. Well, I... Well, Thanks for doing it. No, no. Well, you were one of the first people I thought of, and you honored us with a, a blurb for the book I can't when, believe when it came through. I mean that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about yeah and you came I, I sent you the book and not too long after I think the the quote that you put on the back cover was something along the lines of Roy Benavides was a, a real badass um, he's the one person I'd want beside me if I was surrounded by enemy and running out of ammo and that that really encapsulates who Roy was but you know where did he come from a uh, little town, you know, Cuero, Texas. He was this kid who um, his parents died before he was even in like third grade. He was a sharecropper. Um, he was uh, this, uh, had a, a mean, tough spirit because of the lot in life that he had. Um, he grew up in a town where uh, he, you know, that was back in times of, of pretty solid racism. I mean, he uh, would go to watch a movie and it would say, you know, um, Mexicans and I'm quoting the reality uh, Negroes in the balcony. That's what sign that he would see when he walked into a movie. And he'd sit up in the balcony and watch movies that this way. This would have been in the 60s, right? Uh, it would have been in, no, as a child, it would have been in the more like in the um, 40s, oh, World in the 40s. War II. Oh, yeah, because yeah. he was in Vietnam, Vietnam War. Yeah. So he, he looked beyond all that and um, he wanted to serve his country. You know, even he, he just, that that was how he saw himself getting out of the situation he was in. All right, fellas, let's get real. We all know that 15 minutes or less, it's great for pizza delivery. But when it comes to the bedroom, I think we can do better than that, right? That's where Joy Mode comes in. Their sexual performance booster is a game changer, packed with all natural ingredients to boost your performance and support overall health. No more sketchy gas station fills with who knows what's inside of it. Just mix that all natural powder with water 45 minutes before getting active and you and your partner will be stepping up the game. Whether you're happy or not with your performance currently, I think that we can all agree that it's just more fun to do it better. Be the new sheriff in the bedroom and head to usejoymode.com for 20% off with code TNQ. That's 20% off and free shipping with code TNQ at usejoymode.com. And he, one thing, one story that always stands out for me was they would be on the street and some of the farmers and whatever, the rich farmers and the ranchers would throw out a handful of coins and the kids would scamper for it. Mm. And it got, at first it was a game. Like he thought it was kind of like an Easter egg hunt. And then at some point he realized, you know what, this is, it's costing me something. And, and it, it, he was costing his dignity. He realized he was this kid that was in the dirt, you know, scampering for money. And then it turned into that made him angry. And it got mm. to the point where, no, if someone goes to grab for that coin, it's not a game anymore. I'm going to slug this guy in the face and then take the money from him. And he became this angry kid. And ultimately, that kind of served him well when he got a chance to join the military. Uh, um, he went to a recruiting office. And I think it was the, the Marines 
um, he was at the army and he said, I want to be airborne. And the guy said, he looked at him and he's, he was short, like five, yeah. six. He said, you're too short for the, you know, for the airborne. He said, you can't be there. And he, he slugged this guy in the face. Oh he said, who's taller now? Um, and that was a guy. And so all of a sudden, all the recruiters from the other branches, the Marines came up and said, boy, you got to come join the Marines. And uh, the army actually stood up. He said, no. Another guy came over. He said, this boy, he's, you're airborne all the way, son. And that's how he got his chance to try out for the airborne. <laughs> oh and so he, that, back talking then, about, where they put those guys. Talking about the spirit of back then. And so, you know, he was this guy that when he was in Vietnam, he was flying across the rice paddies and they'd be going over and he'd see like whole families down there, you know, knee deep in water farming. And he'd tell his buddies, that reminds me of my childhood. And they just laugh, had no idea it was real. He, was, mm -hmm. he picked cotton half, you know, the year and sugar beets. And um, that was his childhood. But he always loved America. And he would, you know, later on after, you know, the whole war and everything he went through that we can talk about, he would always say, um, it's not about brown, white, black. He said, you know what we all are? And he'd point at the flag and he'd say red, white, and blue. Um, so he, he was a true patriot. And he spent his time teaching that, that because he said, you know what, this is what it's allowed me. This country has allowed me to come up in this um in this stature and to learn pride and honor and and um service everything it's 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 um it's 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 close to my heart because yeah. so much now in this country is uh going the wrong direction i mm -hmm. think me it's all about there's <laughs> it's all about me they even call it a me too movement mm -hmm. yeah like what about you yeah now that we're looking at you what what, what, do, what do you offer to all of us yeah right. that's what it's about yeah I mean, yeah, well, I get you're special, but how are you special to us? Yeah. That's what a country is, red, white, and blue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how everybody's just saying. What color are you, red, white, and blue? Yeah, I love that. And if you, and, and he was one that, I, as far as I know, he first coined it. He's, it's What's great about Roy's story is that people can find him online. You can look up, you know, when he was um, given the, the Medal of Honor and with the Medal of Honor recipient, yeah. um, not winner. Winner, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's some guys that tear your ass up about that. Yeah. I know. It's true. That's, I mean, it's absolutely true. Right no, I, so. I am, I, I'm a, you know, civilian. I'm an outsider, but I listen. Yeah, and I no know. Goal. It was not a gold medal, and I was like, you didn't win it. No, you earned I didn't it. win anything. I earned it, and earned I'm it, a yeah. recipient. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, you know, he, you know, we can talk about what he did. You, you, you have your impression of what he did, and in that situation, what is it when you did, how did you first hear about him did you hear about him just oh, through training. the military training i'm a green beret bastard i'm an 18 delta medic so okay I, i'm a navy seal but navy seal medics are trained by the army green berets right i didn't know that when i was going in i just kind of <laughs> i tried to find the fastest way to get to seal training and, and the guy and my recruiter was a damn seal <laughs> and he hooked me up man i got full benefit my entire career with all the hardest It ended programs. up being the longest, longest. way. It took me three and a half the years. Longest way. The longest way. <laughs> longest route. I thought it was the shortest. Nope. And uh, so I, I hung out with the Green Berets for a while, over a year. And then I had to go back to Bragg. It's not called Bragg anymore. Do you know that? Yeah. Change the name. I, it'll always be Bragg. What, what's gonna, how are the Army guys going to find it? I know. <laughs> Isn't it called like Victory or I, I, something I don't, like I don't know. Camp Victory or Camp? How am I going to find it? I'm a SEAL. There's no way I'll find it if you change the name. I don't know. I mean, it's just way, that's just the way it is. But we learn about them guys, and we have that. There's a TV channel in the military on deployment called AFN, Armed Forces Network, mm -hmm. and they have these commercials, and they're terrible because we do them ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> and for anybody who knows what I'm talking about, they got their eyes closed and they're shaking their head because they know what an AFN commercial looks like. It's not Good Morning Vietnam. <laughs> 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 well, we have these Medal of Honor moments. Yeah, and they're cool because they they get into they do those right. And I, I've learned so much about our guy. They're because they're all part of our fraternity. Yeah, I mean, inside our fraternity, you got our little crews and our imagine our university. Excuse me. Right. And then inside our university of the military, you got the little fraternities, Green Berets, SEALs, whatnot. Hey, when them suckers got some guys that can put out like that, and I mean going back in there for some more because in combat, it, it, the, the harder it gets, there's something that happens to you. There's a there's a, a mindset. They never capture that in the movies. It's not captured in a book. You have to be there to understand that kind of modality. So when you hear him talking about what these guys have to go through, especially our honor guy, our Medal of Honor guys, I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Freaking unbelievable. Well, what I, what... That's inside of you? 
That that's inside of that. That's when I saw it for the first time. Because mm. most of those stories coming from those hardcore warriors aren't built like me. That kind of stuff stays away from me because of the way I look. It goes after them. <laughs> and they get full benefits. Yeah. Benavides, right? Yeah. <laughs> Five six. Oh freaking Roy. Yeah. That name in itself, he's old Roy. Just that's how I always looked like an old dog that just won't stop protecting. Yeah. Just stocky just, and just, and the guy that you look you would look at him and you say that's he's got a spirit. Um, well, I mean, he basically when he was, for those the listeners don't know who Roy was. What he did was he was he was sent to Vietnam. He chose to go to this uh, camp out near the Cambodian border when we weren't supposed to be in Cambodia, but we were. You know, the uh, Mac V Sog, the Signals and Observation Group, were doing these secret missions over the border into Cambodia across the fence, as they put it. And they were um, trying to find, uh, they, were, well, they were following troop movements and they were trying to find evidence to show that the Ho Chi Minh Trail existed and whatnot. Yeah. Well, this one group had this audacious mission to go and try and capture a Russian truck to prove for the media that Russians were, sell, were, were both um, supplying the war for the um, North Vietnamese and also sneaking around the edges of Laos and Cambodia to get into southern Afghanistan, or Afghanistan, sorry, um, South Vietnam. So there was a team that went in uh, to an area called the Fish Hook. And the Fish Hook was known as the hot spot of, of, of enemy activity at that time. And by chance, they were dropped this three Americans and some SIDG, which was Civilian Individual Defense Group, I believe, um, was the indigenous um, South Vietnamese that were working with them. They were all dressed like Viet Cong, so they would kind of blend in if they were seen in the jungle on the other side of the fence. And they ended up getting dropped basically right in the middle of a whole enemy complex, not knowing it. And they were surrounded and they were getting shot to hell. And Roy was back at the camp and here's all the chaos going on, on the radio. And um, he sees a helicopter come back and it limps in and one of the um, door gunners, or maybe he was a crew, his name was uh, Michael Craig. Uh, he saw him die in, uh, in a, a, a medic's arms right there on the ground. He saw this helicopter shot up. And the first thing Roy says was, you going back out? And he, he basically jumped on. And as he is airborne, he actually realizes he doesn't even have his weapon. The one thing you never forget that's oh drilled God. into you, he had no weapon. He had a sidearm. He, I mean, I'm sorry, he had a, a knife. He had his um, K-bar knife and he had a bottle of Tabasco because he was on his way to breakfast. Oh my gosh. Um, Tabasco sauce. And he flew in to this clearing that was surrounded. Um, there was like a couple ant hills in the middle with futile like saplings and shrubs getting just shot to hell. These 12 guys, half of them were already dead. And there's like 75 yards of open ground, tall waving grass, and they can't get in. It's just too hot. And the pilot that's flying it, his name was uh, Larry McKibben. And it, he, I'm telling you, I saw a picture of him. He looked like he was 12. <laughs> I mean, he was this, but he was this, apparently one of the coolest pilots going. He was, I think, 19 or 20. Um, and he, Roy says, just get me, land me wherever you can. I'll get to them. And so he went across this whole clearing, 75 yards away, dropped Roy with a knife and a medical bag and a bottle of Tabasco. And he ran through enemy lines and through enemy fire all the way through the grass to get to this position and ends up um, you know, using a dead enemy and his own, their own guys' bodies for sandbags. He's wounded 32 times. Lacerations, bayonet, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Oh my God. Bullet holes, um, burned from an RPG and rescued all these guys. Um, another helicopter went down after that and he said saved that crew, got them on. He was, a lot, from what I understand, from all the eyewitnesses that were there, and I got to read all the accounts um, from some people who'd passed, but that wrote it within like just a couple of years. So it was pretty accurate stuff. He was finally coming back to the helicopter and the, um, the Congo guy, his name was Brian O'Connor, uh, said that he was carrying the, their last Sid G interpreter back to the helicopter, holding his own intestines in, got him in the, in the thing, they took off, and they thought he died on the way back. 
And back at camp, they were zipping him up in a body bag. And he was basically, as he explained it himself in his own um, written words, he was frozen. He was basically, uh, he thought he was dead. He couldn't move. He was so in pain. His whole body was frozen. But just when they were getting ready to zip him up, this guy came to check on him, a medic. And he had the wherewithal to, like, some people say he spit, but I actually was able to speak to the medic. And he said he more dribbled. (laughs) <laughs> and he said, wait a minute, this guy's still alive. And he unzipped him, and they traded a body bag out for a stretcher and got him wow. to a hospital. That's, and there you go. I, see, bus, I see it in your eyes, That's about as close as you can get. Yeah. Getting zipped up in one. Yeah. How and, long did he live after that? Um, he uh, lived until uh, 19, I believe, I believe 98, 1998. Wow. But he was always denied a uh, um, uh, the real, I mean, I think he got a silver star, <laughs> something like that. They never, know, they didn't want to bring a lot of attention to it because anything that happened over the fence in Cambodia, we weren't there. So how could they do it? They didn't want to risk that. Mm-hmm. And many years later, um, an, a newspaper man that knew the story actually kind of went after um, the army awards board, whatever it's yeah. called, and got them to reopen the case. And um, that one Como guy, Brian O'Connor, read about this, the, the article that this new, local El Campo, Texas. That's right, um, it's right over there. Yeah. Yep. Um, ended up getting his, um, his article uh, syndicated and it made it to the South Pacific in Fiji where this radio, where this tele, um, sorry, Como guy, Brian O'Connor had been, he read it. That's where and, he wound up? Yeah. And he ended up. a bad place. And he ended up um, writing a, a new letter saying he, he thought that Roy had died. He didn't even know the guy that had basically saved his life was alive. Oh my god! And that's really where it all, you know, opened up the case again and ended up getting to Ronald Reagan, who um, gave him his Medal of Honor. And he said, hey, if, if I were to read a movie script and read this in a movie script, I would not believe it's true. And that's, you know, coming from Ronald Reagan, the actor. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, he just, it, 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 you can find it online. So anyways, I, I got that after I had written Fearless, mm-hmm. um, that, the story after Fearless. And just for a little perspective, Adam Brown overcame. He had the fingers on his right hand crushed off in a Humvee accident. He got his dominant right eye shot out in a sim, from a Sims round. Um, and he overcame all that and still qualified for Tier 1 Dev Grew SEAL Team 6. Uh, so people thought of him as, you know, wait, you, well, the armorer who helped adjust his sight says, come on, Adam, come clean. You're a Jedi, right? And, you know, Adam, like you said, that hayseed said, nah, I just pray a lot. Yeah. And so I had that story behind me and I had no, and, and then I found out about legend. And the way I sold legend was I talked to Christy Fletcher, my agent, and mm-hmm. chatted with it. And she just said, just write me a letter. What I talked to her on the phone and she said, write what you just told me into a letter and send it to me. Mm-hmm. And I, what I basically wrote was when I finished fearless and wrote about Adam Brown, I thought that there's no way and I could ever find a story that surpasses what this guy went through. Um, but I think I found it and his name's Roy Benavides. And that's oh how I sold. Gosh. Oh, we, we got him. Yeah. It's not that they outdo him. It's just a different story altogether. Different kind yeah. of story. Because um, uh, trying to, when you read our Medal of Honor citations, that's that's how you see that. Because yeah. you'll be like, oh, you know, this should be the, the, the criteria to get this. Yeah, and then somebody will roll in with a story that's so unbelievable. They're like, "Oh, we don't have a medal for that." Right. <laughs> we we just don't have a medal for it. Right. Do you think that that's going to be made into a movie? Um, I can only hope. I've talked about Hollywood and my thoughts. Um, mm-hmm. and it's Hollywood's a tough nut to crack, it and is. it takes a lot. And you know, for a long time, Vietnam was not exactly yeah. a popular war. Still, yeah. like they really. I, I like been. watching that. I don't watch movies on my war. Yeah. yeah, I have a real problem. I don't know if it's a problem. I guess they call it a problem, but I just don't do that. Well, you're too. But I watch the older ones. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I did you. I mean, I grew up with you know Apocalypse Now and P- Platoon and um, Full Metal Jacket and you know all these amazing. And I, I, it, it just it's taken a while for somebody to get a hold of it. And but there is I can't officially say who, but the person that is interested is a Texan. And highly involved in Hollywood, and loves Roy's story. And um, we it's have a, a script. <laughs> <laughs> and, there, and there's I a, am involved. And, a, and there's a, a script being um, uh, developed right now. That's awesome for Legends. So I hope we'll it see. Does. Yeah. So 
for our listeners, that book is called Legend. And then you've got another book coming out um, the week that this will release. Oh, great. Um, wow. And uh, tell us about that because that's not military at all. That went back it's to not. your roots. It did. I mean, I started this whole thing. Uh, like I said, I kind of got involved with writing about the military after 9-11 kind of mm-hmm. to, to do my part and uh, to, you know, it was kind of training on it, honestly, I think, for telling the story of a, of a friend. Um, Craig Kelly was kind of the Sean White of snowboarding in the 1980s uh, and into the 90s. And he was kind of like the, uh, uh, the analogy that I often use is Michael Jordan. Imagine if you go to a basketball court and uh, today, a pickup game somewhere, and some kid's wearing a Michael Jordan jersey. And imagine some kid looks at that kid and says, who's Michael Jordan? Well, the same thing happened to me at a, at a ski area. I had a sticker that said, my friend was Craig Kelly. And he was like the Sean White of that era. And I had a Craig Kelly as my co-pilot sticker, which is um, after he was killed in an avalanche, I had put this sticker. They, these stickers went around. I can't remember the exact name of the guy that made it. I wish I could honor him because it was such a great idea. But he created these stickers that were all over our generation. Um, and um, somebody in the lift line looked over at that sticker and said, who's Craig Kelly? And I was floored because to me, it was like what I just said. Mm-hmm. It would be like somebody, he was as big to us in snowboarding as let's say Michael Jordan would be in, in basketball. basketball. Yeah. And so his story was had never told. And he was kind of like the first true professional in snowboarding. Because w- that was when it was coming online. Mm-hmm. Right. It was very early on. Because there was kind of this overshadow of like, hey, who are you skied? That was just, and I'm not even a skier. Right. But I remember that. I yeah. remember them talking about like, what is this whole thing? And there was only a handful of people doing it. Yeah. Like it always is. That's yeah. how it always starts. Now it's in the Olympics. Oh, yeah. No, it was voted, Time Magazine voted it the worst sport of 1983. I believe. <laughs> is, that, is, is that true? It's true. It's in, I have it quoted in the book and it's quoted, it was quoted and, and, and then Parade Magazine quoted the Time article and call and then called it. Um, I think the, the subtitle at the very not subtitle, but an addendum at the end was um, something like it's. Uh, this sport is all about raging, you know, young men oh, raging no. hormones, <laughs> ra- and raging hormones. And then it said something like, um, "Remember when they just took cold showers?" <laughs> And, uh, and so that was, I mean, snowboarding was like the bastard son of the elite skier, big brother. And half the, you know, most You weren't skiers, even allowed to go down their runs. No, they weren't, we weren't allowed right. at most ski areas. Damn segregators. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, they did. They, about, uh, they, they I mean, totally did. There was, yeah, there was no privilege. They still privilege. have segregated uh, They do. They're still skiers. It's still kind of funny about it. Well, yeah. I, Park I, City. Uh, huh? It's Park City. Uh, Deer Valley. Deer Valley. Deer Valley, Deer Valley um, doesn't allow it. Mad River Glen. Doesn't they, their, their motto at Mad River Glen in Vermont is um, ski it if you can. And um, this one snowboarder came back, his name's Greg Saladino, and he came out with a, an answer to that. And he said, I'd ride it if I could. <laughs> That's good. Um, is that Vermont? Yeah, it's yeah. Vermont? Yeah. We were just up there. Yeah, we just did yeah. Vermont. So there's a few areas that still don't allow it. I actually did a whole story. This We won't even go into it, but I snuck on to all the resorts that didn't allow it back then on the early split boards. And I would buy a lift ticket and I would ride up the chairlift as a skier. I'd sn- duck into the woods at the top of the most crowded run back into a snowboard and I'd snowbow down the, the middle and I would do it as many times as I can before the ski patrol tackled me or they kicked me <laughs> off the mountain. And I wrote a story about it. It was called Live and Let Ride. That is hilarious. And that's how you protest. Yes. <laughs> exactly. That's how you protest. I know, I know. Because it was- then it's fun for the ski patrol to chase you. Yeah. You know, you're learning, you're riding, you ain't hurting nobody. And at the bottom, you tell them, I had no idea, and they try and kick you out. I'm like, I bought a lift ticket. Can I get a refund? And I have to yeah. say, Park City did give me a refund. The ne- I did it at Park City the following year, and I called the story Irony and the Wasatch, the Wasatch Mountains, <laughs> yeah. because they didn't allow snowboarding. At the same time, they were bidding to have the Olympic snowboarding events at Park City. That's where the first pipe came out, right? Was it in Park City? No, they have the half pipe. Sean, that's where he time. tore it up, right? Park City, no, that was actually, believe it or not, that was pre Sean. Um, it was, uh, he came within the next Olympics. That would have been when, oh gosh, uh, 
I I think it was Ross Powers. Uh, uh, I'm forgetting the three guys, but they were on the cover of Rolling Stone on a chairlift. Um, I'm, I'm I so sorry. I can't started. believe I'm. Yeah, I can't I'm, remember. I'm sorry, guys, that I'm not remembering all three of your names. But Ross Powers was, I think, the gold medalist. Oh, you're going to hear about it. I know. I'm going to hear about it. Jeez, <laughs> man. Can we cut this in later? <laughs> <laughs> this um, is how I get. This is how I get in trouble too. Oh my god. Go you go talking about talking shop about somebody who's great and you can't remember their damn last name or something. Like, you know what? I, you know what I call that? Uh, I call that fifty. First or CRS. Almost. You know what CRS is, right? I'm going to use 55. Where'd 50, you come up? I'm 55. Are you 55? No, no. I'm 55 just because I figure that's my brain. Right. But I will say that um, this this we were in the, the um, outback in Australia when my wife and I first met. We were traveling around the world for before we were married. Um, and we were in the outback and this lady had this coffee cup that said CRS. And... I asked her what it meant, and she said, "Oh, it's what I, it's a, it's a disease I have." And I was like, "Oh, I'm so sorry." <laughs> oh. And she's all, "Yeah." I said, "Oh, don't worry, my kids got it for me." You know what it means? I'm all, "What?" She's all, "Can't remember shit." Mm. <laughs> and that's that is was her thing. So that, I, I use that that's all the time. One. But um, I'm so anyways, that from you actually, it, it's good, right? It's good. Yes. Pretty good. Um, but that was that was what brought me to um. Oh, okay. So back to Craig Kelly and the Darkest White, just to full circle it. Um, he was just he was um. He was just an icon. He was like the North Star, the guy that everybody followed. So Craig basically, and he was this North Star. Everybody looked up to him. He was the first true professional. Sim Snowboards and Burton Snowboards had a huge lawsuit about against about him fighting for him uh, because he left one contract, started another one when he thought the other one was done, and they had the first major lawsuit. Um, and he just was a guy that had, he, he was the smoothest style. He stood out on the slope. And he was um, an ambassador, kind of merged that gap. He was yeah. a well-spoken guy who quit a degree in chemical engineering two quarters shy of graduating to try and make it to the pro snowboarder in a sport that didn't even exist. So it's a, it's, the book is about the history of snowboarding with his thread of his life through it. And at the end, he kind of circles back, leaves all the fame and fortune because he wants to just go back to the mountains and free ride. And he wants to be, learn to become a, oh, mountain, spirit. a mountain guide. Yeah, spirit will go. And during his mountain guide training, um, he's killed tragically in an, in an avalanche. And if I can just put your listeners into that moment, imagine um, you're in the mountains with 21 people. You're being led by this uh, a legendary Swiss Canadian mountain guide. There's two groups, and I'm not going to say where Craig was in the groups because it kind of spoils things. But imagine there's 21 people, and all of a sudden this avalanche hits, and there's seven people left at the top of this crown of this avalanche that ripped down this mountain. And they peer back down over the edge and 13 people have been erased from the world. They're under the snow. And you know that you have minutes, you know, to get to these people. But there's only seven people. One of them is the guide and the other seven are clients in the group, not even the trained personnel. And it's, it's a guide's worst nightmare. Mm -hmm. And that was um, the end of, that's towards the end of the book. So I kind of explained the whole idea of snow science and avalanche predicting and um, how people have learned over time to predict avalanches um, wrapped around this guy who was, you know, a chemical engineer turned pro snowboarder before there was even a sport and it all merges together in this disaster narrative that I hope people will learn from. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's 20 years after Craig passed away, but he was a good friend and he was a hero mm -hmm. of a different kind. And I just want to make sure that the new generation hears about him and that his, his name isn't forgotten. Are you having trouble sleeping? Because if you are, you're not alone. Nights filled with tossing, turning, and waking up tired were all too familiar to me. But then, I discovered something that truly changed the game. It's called Shh Tape. What is Shh Tape, you might ask? It is your solution to a restful night's sleep, a fresh start, a new beginning. Say goodbye to snoring, mouth breathing, and other sleep disruptions, because with Shh Tapes, comfortable and high quality design you'll be sleeping through the night no problem just imagine being able to wake up without your partner's complaints and yelling about your snoring for once wouldn't that be such a relief ready to bid farewell to sleep visit tape.com and use code tnq50 for 50 percent off your order that is s-h-h-t-a-p-e.com with code tnq50 don't let another restless night pass get tape and start sleeping soundly tonight and 
um, before we started recording, you were telling me a story about uh, where y'all got to ski or snowboard together. Oh, yeah. No, what, well, one of the, I, I got to know Craig um, on assignment, various stories and whatnot, but we went snowboarding to, um, in Iran, um, which oh, not too many people have gone to. talking about that. And it was uh, like, quite, on, man. yeah. And I mean, I honestly, I was ignorant. I didn't even know there were mountains in Iran when I first real heard it, but it was his, actually his second trip. The first time he went was with this, uh, this, uh, horse wrangler from Durango, Colorado named Jack Turner had found out about this opportunity to go to Iran and he put together a trip, but the snow wasn't very great. So Craig always wanted to go back. And um, in 2000, he invited me to be the writer for the story. And we went back and the snow was pretty dang good. It was still kind of sketchy, but at least it was deep. Um, and we just had an amazing time. And it, it's, it's interesting. People don't realize that it's still kind of that... I don't know, it's just a different world. I mean, there's different lift lines for men and women. Mm. Um, you get on a bus and the women are in the back. Yeah, um, and that's just somewhere that no one thinks about going to and no th unless you're in the military. Right, <laughs> and they have 18,000 foot peaks. I mean, the story was, I called it, I think I called it Beyond Tehran. Um, and they're huge mountains and they're beautiful and the people are amazing. And we got invited to a party. Um, I, you know, there was a guy on a chairlift that pulled me onto a chairlift and he, and he was a couple buddies. And as we went up the lift, he started singing to me, like serenading me. <laughs> and I was like, what? And then I was kind of like, oh, whoa, I know, I know, I know. Talk There's about getting me in a spot I can't get all out of, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, hey, this is my stop. I'll get out right here. Exactly. <laughs> that, and but, but I, that's what I thought. But then what I realized was he was actually singing me a song um, up for his girlfriend. And it was his, he said, this is all I, I can give you. This is my gift to you. Um, this is um, my, and then he introduced me to his girlfriend as she got off the woman lift oh, on the other side and said, this is my girlfriend. My and he gosh. said, look at her eyes. Cause you know, she was covered, but she had oh eyes. And she said, and then she said, he said, I know. He said, you have life in America. He said, this, this isn't life. He said, um, but he said, but that, and I said, well, thank you. And he said, yeah, the, the song is, is for my girlfriend. Um, I wrote it about my girlfriend, but it's my gift to you. Oh, how yeah. sweet. Yeah, it was pretty cool. That is so crazy. I could not imagine going. I mean, we like to travel to off beaten path places, but I, Iran is not. <laughs> not on, on my that. list. <laughs> on well, well, list. No, I, my, my wife and family, everybody, they were nervous. They were, Are you sure you want to go? We couldn't even go through the State Department. We had to get our visas through the um, embassy of Pakistan, and I had to pick it up in Germany. Oh. So I, I, we couldn't gosh. as an American. They didn't want us to go there either. But I, we went because, you know why we went? Because Craig Kelly asked me. To, that's oh the guy. Who, I mean, he had me at Craig Kelly. Like, Do we know who the first there. guy to strap on a board is? Uh, you know what? That's a is tough that one. Okay, but it, I, I do thought. cover. No, it's a tough one. But I do know what. It's got to be two guys, right? Just sitting there going, hey, let's do this. Well, the first one that got snowboarding popular was named Sherman Poppin. It was Christmas morning, 1965. And he... Um, was sent outside. He was in Muskegon, Michigan, and he was sent outside because his wife was really pregnant. He had two daughters. They were hyped up on candy canes and tearing the house apart. And his wife said, "Sure, yeah, I've been there. Get my, get the kids out of the house." Well, it was a new snow, a lot for Muskegon. It hadn't frozen yet, so it was you know cold. And so their sled was a classic one with metal runners. And he, it was, it was this deep. It was just sinking. They wouldn't run. And so he had always been fascinated by surfing and he had actually right then Gidget had become a, a new show that same like season and his daughter had been he remembered his daughter's trying to stand up on the sled to surf because she'd been watching Gidget so he took two skis and Gidget and, good lord there's a shotgun yeah. out of past <laughs> right yeah. he, and you know what Gidget was short for right uh -uh. no girl and midget the guys all called her that because she was short How to, funny. and a girl. So they called her Gidget. Gidget. Right, and so it. he turned around and this guy, Sherman Poppin, um, got a couple dowels and hooked two of his daughter's like children's skis together to make a wide board. And she stood up on it and that kept him on top of the powder. And they spent the whole afternoon surfing this snow covered sand dune in Muskegon, Michigan. And his wife called it a snurfer uh. blending snow and surfer there we go yeah and all the kids wanted it he got it patented 
And then that was kind of the beginning of it all. And Jake Burton Carpenter ultimately... Um, I know who he of, is. He, he ended up basically trying to go enter a snurfing competition with one of his own homemade boards that actually had like kind of bindings. This, the snurfer had no binding. It was just you stand on it like a skateboard. Like a regular surfboard. Right. Or a surfboard. So that's the beginning. And that's Snurfing. ultimately... Snurfing. Okay, check. I that ultimately that. was Jake Burton entered that contest. Now... There's a guy named Tom Sims who was a skateboarder that says he built the first one in 1963. I'm not saying that didn't happen, um, but it, there was some uh, there's some con, um, controversy in the industry oh, of who yeah. was first. Yeah, yeah, oh, but there's no doubt that that Sherman Poppin they ended up making like a million of these snurfers, and so at a commercial Lord, level, can you find those? Oh, they're around. If you can an find original a snurfer, yeah, you can find them. You should look for one because they would look pretty nice here. In, in with yeah, the, on in this wood studio. right here, it'd be pretty sweet. So, my brother and my my oldest, they do all. My youngest, they surf the snowboard and snurf. Yeah. And, well, there's a well in the opening pages of the book right there. Um, it kind of tells that. I start the story with that, and Craig Kelly was born. Um, just. Uh, like two and a half weeks after he registered the patent. But it's a, it's a, the history is amazing. And there's people that have been doing it like in Turkey, um, where they there do it go. with a stick, all sorts of things. So that one to the bottom right with the two skis, that's the very first one. That's his house in Muskegon, Michigan, to the right. Yeah, the one yeah, with yeah, the yeah. two skis. Yeah. And then he ended up experimenting with um, putting ropes on the end to help. Actually, it was so you could drag it behind you when you walked up, but then they realized you could help steer with it. And that's really was the first one that inspired Jake Burton Carpenter, which then led to Craig's first board, which was a Burton Backhill. And again, no bindings. Dude, the Poppin' Sherman would have been a good name. Poppin' Sherman. The Poppin' Sherman. <laughs> oh my God. But what a guy, right? And look at him, he was like a guy yeah, that yeah. was in the welding industry and he patented this and um, he, he actually uh, met Craig and um, at a like a lifetime achievement award thing that our magazine Trans World Snowboarding put together at one point, and it's it's pretty fun. So, out of uh, all the places you've been as a writer for the snowboarding magazine, what's your favorite snow you've ever ridden? I I mean, just for quality and abundance and terrain and everything. I love BC, Canada, British Columbia, Canada, yeah. like all the areas around, um, you know, yeah, and Whist Whistler uh -huh. is a great mountain. Um, but honestly, at this point in my life, anywhere where there's snow, I mean, I think just being on the mountain and carving, yeah, it's just, you know, I, I'm keeping my board on the ground now. As, um, but once upon a time, I would, you know, jump over a road or do a few big you know, errors and rode the half pipe. But um, it's just such a healthy way to, you know, be out in nature. Yeah. Have something, and something that's fun to do. It's kind of, I think snowboarding kind of blended, brought people from the urban areas into the mountains because there was that skateboarding, skateboard, surfing angle. Yeah. And <laughs> so that's, that's kind of the board that Craig actually learned on. <laughs> and he, um, that's a Burton Backhill, I would say, early Burton Backhill. Oh, that's pretty and cool. And I can't tell, but I, that kind of looks like it could be Jake Burton. Um, but... Uh, Carpenter. Uh, he, his name kind of eased into Bert. Burton was named after um, his middle name um, is after I think a, a grandmother who passed away that I think gave him his first loan to start the company. So mm. he called the company in her honor Burton. Oh, nice. Um, but his it, that's his middle name, and so a lot of people call him Jake Burton, but he's really Jake Burton. Carpenter. Nice. A carpenter. Um, carpenter is his last. He is a carpenter? Name. No, that's his last name. His last <laughs> name. But he did build his first boards in a barn, and it's it's just an amazing story, really. I mean, it, it goes from this, like, uh, army of misfits hobby, cult hobby. Some of the this, skaters and the surfers and the bike guys. Yeah, we were, we were army, of, it. army of misfits, that's and now it. it's, like, the most watched Olympic sport. And X game, every. X Games all the sure. time even when the Olympics are gone there's, there's something going on because it's our wintertime deal yeah mm -hmm. no totally I I think that really the it, it's just a way the book is really I think the first way that you can follow the history of the sport while also following the thread of somebody's story mm -hmm. and it's never been done before there's lots of little history pieces and things like that and, and it was just finally time and what made it the time was this guy telling me on a chairlift line who's Craig Kelly and it just shocked me and I thought wow before this guy's name disappears to history, let's um, get it out there. I love book. that you're telling this story. And I mean. Yeah, you definitely do a great job of talking about our important Americans. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. I mean, this is, this is you know, Jake Burton was a, a story of capitalism and 
He also, if you look at it, snowboarding is spread around the world. Craig actually introduced the sport with other riders to Russia, to uh, he's been to China, he's been to Siberia, all these random places. And you, you look over there and you see all these countries, they weren't making these, they didn't have the time. They were in communist Russia where they were didn't have this wherewithal. So I've met Russian riders who would always look to Craig and and these um, you know visionaries, Tom Sims, uh, Dmitry Milovich did the winter snick. There's a, a board called Flight Snowboards from Rhode Island that no one's ever heard of because honestly, like Sims and Burton kind of just took over the industry. But uh, there was a whole just a whole huge crew of people that just loved to snowboard and they were building them in their backyards and it turned into this great thing. And yeah, I was in the, the early the early phases of it. So I was there. He was my hero. So as a lifelong snowboarder, what is your favorite board? Oh boy, gosh. I gotta be careful because I know <laughs> I, I I have a legion I don't you know that whole allegiance thing, like what if I don't know if you have an issue saying what's your favorite gun or not because there's or anything right. like that, you know, brand. Or top but, um, five. I will say, well honestly, even though Burton is kind of one of the the largest, it's considered the so called corporate board, mm -hmm. they're also the only one company that never they talk about selling out. You know, they've never sold out. They're still an independent company. So I, I've, I've always been a real fan of Burton. Mm -hmm. Although in the beginning, I was all about Sims because Sims snowboards actually worked. Mm -hmm. They were much, they were better. And honestly, the, Burton snowboards took um, Craig, didn't take him. They, Craig left Sims snowboards to go to Burton. And it was kind of like Michael Jordan and the, Michael Jordan Air for Nike. They brought that's what made Nike a household name in the basketball world, mm -hmm. which really shopped them up in the running world and overall of the company. Craig did the same thing when he went to Burton. All of a sudden, he gave Burton credibility over Sims snowboards and brought the freestyle style riding into to Burton, which is mm -hmm. probably a little hard to follow for your listeners. But it's um, it's. It's it's it, it, there, there's so many similarities in different industries where yeah. you know you need a hero, you need somebody that people will identify with, and he was just that guy that people would identify with. I yeah, love but, Burton. I love Burton boards. I'm just gonna say it right now. I love Burton boards. I love Jones snowboards. They make great split boards. Um, and recently, I've been uh, another really old school brand is Winter Stick, and I ride a Winter Stick. So those are my three boards and gear. I pretty much stick with Jer Burton Jones and. Um, I have a new winter stick. I also love GNU or LibTech is another brand that's amazing. But those are the, the standbys. You can never go wrong. You can find a board, a, a Burton board for sure that will work for you. That's I awesome. feel like most all Americans, most everybody, even if you're not into a sport, you know a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. And when you say snowboard and you say that Burton name, it's, it's just, you're just synonymous. Yeah. It is. Growing up, what we did, we grew up with the Michaels. You got Michael Jordan in basketball, Mike Tyson in boxing, Michael Jackson in singing, and uh. it's kind of like, it's just it's on and on and on. <laughs> it's true. I never thought of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a lot. Exactly. So when the, some of those top names, and they, they just, like Arnold Schwarzenegger in bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows who that dude is. Nobody. I asked my son the other day, just have, I, I didn't mean to insult him. He's 12. Yeah. And I, I, uh, we were talking about something. I'm a big fan of Arnold. And I was like, son, you know who Arnold Schwarzenegger is? And he looked at me like I was the stupidest bastard. <laughs> ever and I mean, I saw there was a look that came over his face that I'd never seen before. It just automatically happened to me. And he kind of flat eyed me and was like, dad. And I was like, okay, son. Yeah, it's so, good. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was great. That's I love it. Yeah. You know, I love it. There's nothing he can do about it. He wasn't trying to do it. It just happened. Totally. <laughs> oh, no, it's no different. It's no different than like the kids bringing up a song. Dude, this is band I love right now. And I'm like, really? Oh, I would listen to that when I was 12. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. And apparently, yesterday, we were, he was calling me out on cars. He's like, I, like he knows more about it. He's really into cars he's now. He's really into cars. He's like, Dad, you don't know anything about cars. I was like, boy, I know everything about cars. You know, you're testing me. So. It's um, it's great. It is. It's it's a, hey, hey, it's just it's people, things change. You know, um, everything evolves, and you just gotta. It's, I just think it's important to know your history. Sure. Yeah. Where it comes from. Thank you for yeah. writing about it and keeping. And you the do a great job of doing that too. And, Thank you very yeah. much. No, it's an honor to be here, and you know, you're you're a house. You are a household name, and people look to you as somebody who stands for. Um, I would just say America. God bless it. Yeah. Where, uh, real quick, where's your? Um, are you gonna do book signings? Can you? Yeah, what do we need to do? People follow you. I uh, well, 
www.ericblim.com. You can always find there. I just got horribly hacked recently. And so my Facebook was shut down because someone fraudulently got a hold of my Facebook and used it for bad advertisements. So oh I don't know if I'm going to have Facebook, but Instagram is my spot. Okay. I, um, uh, Eric Blem official on Instagram. I'll be posting everything there. That's kind of like my hub right now. Okay. And um, I have uh, an event at... Uh, in Boulder, Colorado, on February 27th is the day the book launches. Uh, February 29th in Edwards, um, I think it's called Bookworm in Edward, Colorado. Then I'm going to be at Santa Monica, the Santa Monica Burton flagship store on the 29th of February. It's a leap nice. year, there's 29. And then March 1st, close to my hometown in the Barnes & Noble in Encinitas, California. Um, nice. Those are my one, the ones I know of right now. More will, more will pop up along the way. I'm going to get some Burton boards out of this. I know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't um, board, but, you know, I can have a cool one hanging on my wall. Hunter will go. Hunter's I know. Good. All my kids do. <laughs> I know. I want one. Yeah. No, it's... Uh, Is the original Burton... What, does there, he have it? I mean... What, what? Oh, yeah. No, I, actually, I do have a back hill board. My first board without... That we just dropped was called a Slicker. And it was made by a skateboarder named Steve Cathy in the same era as that um he was a gns skate pro skateboarder but there's a lot of old boards if you start looking at i mean nostalgia is coming that's why it's a good time for this book, that's I think, exactly what's happening our generation is coming back around got some coin in their pocket and they're yeah. like hey i want some of my stuff yeah it just and it, it went it happened maybe a decade ago started with surfing now it's going towards snowboarding you know skateboarding yeah. tony hawk tony hawk got a saw on tv doing a commercial for cunal <laughs> CoQ10 or some <laughs> kind of statin thing. I was like, God, are we old? Uh, I was like one of my skate heroes up there talking about <laughs> bad knees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he is still, he did, did you see, he did a, a documentary He's called a badass, Til, man. Till the wheels fell off. Yeah, till the wheels it, fall off. I yeah. did see that. It's yeah. good. It's amazing. Marcus uh, loves like every pro, like every household name of every sport, he follows that's it. That's my, my hot man. I'm a freaking he athlete. Really bro. just dives into. I follow their whole life. We grew up together. Yeah. I feel like we grew up together. Yeah. Totally. When you, when you learn or hear their names throughout your life, he always says, yeah, I grew up with him. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay. That's the weirdest thing. People walk up to me and they'll know stuff about me. I don't know them. It's a weird feeling. And, but I know I just say, like when I walk into, if, if I was to walk into Tony Hawk, I'd be like, bro, I, I know all about you, man. I, you know, I know shit about you. You don't even know. Exactly. Yeah. People that, have said That's that. the crazy part. It's that, true. It's just like, it's, and it's true. It's so, so true. Cause you do, you forget about some of your own stuff. And then, but you know, the, people talk and they, when you hear them, the, when they run across you and run other people and they'll tell you some stuff. Cause you open up. Yeah. That's the face to face will always be the end all be all. It's true. It's true. Those phones, the TVs, all that stuff gets in the way. The minute Absolutely. you get a chance to sit down with somebody. Yeah. And do and talk face to face and really hear the way they explain something that that changes things. If you add the smell of campfire, and well, now we're talking about a different level. <laughs> like when you get into that whole thing, that's the real part. Exactly. If you can get around the campfire with them, that's that's the, the true done spirit. Deal. Of, yeah, it's done deal, man. <laughs> I agree. Oh, you guys, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. This is the Team Never Quit podcast. podcast. Don't buckle up, Buttercup. <laughs> <laughs>